One of the two semi-plenary presentations today is given by Dana Kulic from Monash University, Australia. The 50 minutes presentation is followed by a live panel discussion, including selected experts on the topic. The session is chaired by Sandra Hirche from the Technical University of Munich, who will now introduce the speaker. It is my great pleasure to chair this semi-plenary session at IFEC World Congress 2020. My name is Sandra Hirche and I am affiliated with Technical University of Munich in Germany. I am standing here also in my role as the co-chair of the International Program Committee for this exciting Congress. This semi-plenary will be given by Dana Kulic from Monash University in Australia. I have known Dana since nearly 15 years by now. Our ways first crossed in Tokyo, where we both were postdocs then, even though in different labs. Now I'm very happy that we could convince her to give this semi-plenary talk and also participate in a subsequent panel session. Let me briefly introduce Dana before we come to her presentation. Dana's research is on robotics and human-robot interaction. In particular, she develops autonomous systems that can operate in concert with humans using natural and intuitive interaction strategies. Dana has received her bachelor, master and PhD degrees from the University of British Columbia in Canada. In 2006, she was awarded the prestigious postdoc fellowship from the Japanese Society for the Promotion of Science. She then joined the University of Tokyo and became a project assistant professor at the Nakamura Yamane Lab. In 2009, she moved back from Japan to Canada, where together with colleagues, she established Waterloo as one of Canada's leading research centers in robotics. Since 2019, she is now a professor at Monash University and director of Monash Robotics. Throughout her career, she has been holding various visiting professorships, for example, at Tokyo University of Agriculture and Technology and at Technical University of Munich. Nana is very well known for her significant contributions to the state of the art in human-robot interaction. She pioneered approaches to quantify and control safety during human-robot interaction based on both robot and human perception. Furthermore, she developed one of the first systems to implement continuous learning from demonstration, which enables the learning from non-experts. Very notable are also her results in human motion analysis, which enable highly accurate non-invasive measurement of human movement for rehabilitation and industrial settings. And now, Dana, we look forward to your talk on estimating human objectives from action and interaction. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining me. It is a great honor to be delivering this semi-plenary lecture at IFAC, and I want to thank the organizers very much for inviting me and also for all their amazing work organizing the conference in these challenging times. In this talk, I would like to tell you a little bit about our work on estimating human objectives from action and interaction. My research is in the area of human-robot interaction. For most of us, well before we encountered a real robot, we became aware of robots through movies, books, cartoons, and other forms of fiction. The robots of our imagination are not just capable of performing a variety of tasks, they can anticipate our wishes and cater to our every need. Unfortunately, real robots are very far from achieving these capabilities. To move towards these abilities, robots need to be able to understand human objectives. How does a robot figure out what the person wants? There are two aspects to this question. The first aspect is how can we figure out what the person's objective is from their own behavior? So if you're observing uh, their movement uh, or a sequence of actions, can we figure out what the person is trying to achieve? The second aspect is how can we figure out what the person wants the robot to do and how they want the robot to do it if the person is not able to provide the demonstration themselves? So in this talk, uh, I will talk about these two aspects. The first aspect is how we can estimate human uh, objectives from their observed movement. And this is very closely related to learning from demonstration. So learning robot behavior by observing a human teacher perform the action. This can be useful for understanding what people are trying to achieve so that the robot can provide appropriate assistance 
and also for improving our understanding of the human motor control system more fundamentally, which is obviously interesting for biomechanics, uh, neuroscience, and bioinspired design. In the second part of the talk, I will talk about how we can estimate human objectives for robot behavior. So this type of problem is particularly salient when we have robots that are non-human shaped. In this case, it may not be possible for a person to demonstrate their preferences accurately, so it's important to use other modalities such as uh, interaction or correction to elicit human preferences. So let's get started with how uh, we can estimate human objectives from observed movement. So this um, question is very closely related to uh, robot learning from demonstration. So robot learning from demonstration has been a very active field in robotics for the past 20 years. Um, I myself started working on this topic during uh, my postdoctoral fellowship at the Nakamura lab with uh, Professor Yoshi Nakamura. Uh, and so here is a, a workflow of the system that we developed. Um, so in robot learning from demonstration, we assume that the human is an expert at the task and we would like to observe their demonstration and then reproduce it on the robot. So first we need to measure the human movement. Um, and this can be done with a variety of sensor modalities. Uh, so it could be motion capture, it could be wearables, or it could be camera-based systems. Uh, so in this particular example, we're using motion capture. So we're measuring Cartesian positions of markers on the body. Uh, and then uh, in the next step, what we would like to do is convert those measurements into joint angles. Um, so for example, by using inverse kinematics. So um, after this conversion, what we have is a trajectory of joint angles. And if we have a longer demonstration sequence consisting of multiple action primitives, the next phase, we need to perform temporal segmentation. So observing this longer time series of human joint angles, what we would like to do is we would like to identify from the time series each individual action or motion primitive. Once we have identified uh, or segmented these primitives, then what we would like to do is learn a model for each of these action primitives. Um, and then we would also like to learn a model of how the action primitives are sequenced in the longer behavior. And once we have a model of each of the action primitives and also their sequencing, we can use that model to regenerate the motion on a humanoid robot. So let me show, show you a short video of how we do this. And uh, uh, so here we're first going to observe human movement. Um, so here we're using a motion capture. So we have a human demonstrator that is performing a sequence of full body movements. And in this case, we don't know a priori anything about the movement. So we don't know what the primitives are going to be, nor how they're going to be sequenced. Uh, and you can see here the person is performing uh, some arbitrary sequence of full body actions. So uh, after we measure the marker position, the trajectory of the marker positions, we would like to first convert those marker positions into joint angles. Um, and in this example, we convert directly to the robot joint angles by using the robot kinematic model. And then we have this uh, time series data of the joint angles. And what we would like to do is extract the segment point, so where one action primitive starts and uh, when it ends. So in this case, for example, we have arm raise, then arm lower, then bow, uh, then step, and so on. And then what we would like to do is learn a model of each of the motion primitives and also how those uh, primitives can be sequenced. Uh, and we would like this to be a generative model so that we can then reproduce the motion on a humanoid robot, like we can see here. Now, in this particular work, what we learned about the motion was at the trajectory level. So we learned a model of the trajectory of the movement. So this is great for these kind of full body movements uh, that where the person and the robot are moving in free space, but it may not be ideal if we have task relevant movements. Because if we only learn a trajectory and the task context changes, then it's not really clear how we can modify that learned trajectory to uh, adapt to the changed uh, task or environmental context. So what we would really like to do is learn not just the trajectory, but also the control objective of the demonstrator. So this will allow us to understand what was the kind of underlying goal of the demonstrator so that we can more easily generalize to task variations 
and possibly even different embodiments. So in this class of approaches, which are commonly known as inverse optimal control or inverse reinforcement learning, we assume that the observed trajectory was generated by an optimal controller in the central nervous system, and our aim is to infer the control objectives. So uh, here is kind of the modified workflow. So we, again, we want to measure the movement and extract joint angles using pose estimates. And then we also want to perform temporal segmentation. Uh, so the reason why we need the temporal segmentation is because we know that over a longer uh, time sequence, the control objective might be changed, right? So if I'm performing some kitchen task, um, maybe my first objective is to reach towards the fridge, then my objective is to open the fridge, and so on. And so I need this temporal segmentation to identify each of these uh, short-term sequences where the control objective was constant. Once I have that se uh, segmented part of the motion, where I can as assume that the control objective is constant, now what I would like to do is I would like to recover what, was, what were the objectives of the controller. And then once I know those objectives, then I can use that within an optimal control framework and generate that uh, and uh, generate uh, the appropriate motion on the robot that achieves the same objective. And the hope is, is that this will allow uh, the robot to be able to better generalize because if my objective is to you know reach for the uh, for an object and that object moves, I still know how I uh, you know what the, uh, what the objective is so that I can uh, reproduce that task. And then I can also incorporate additional constraints. So for example, if I have joint limits or torque limits, or even if the embodiment of the robot is different than that of the demonstrator, I still know how to accomplish the task. So just a quick bit of background. Um, so uh, in this uh, scenario, the uh, human body and the human system is solving the optimal control problem. So in this case, we have a dynamical system, in this case, the human body, which uh, is modeled as um, by a set of states uh, x uh, that evolve according to some nonlinear dynamical model, the equations of motion, uh, based on input, uh, control input u. And uh, the human central nervous system has some cost function that it's trying to optimize uh, to generate the optimal trajectory, which is denoted as x star uh, and u star. And the length of the trajectory is capital T. Now, the inverse optimal control problem is we have that same dynamical system, and we observe the optimal trajectory of states and inputs. And now what we would like to do is we would like to recover the underlying cost function. So um, it's very common uh, to model the cost function as a weighted sum of features. Uh, so we have the weights w uh, and the features phi. So what are these features? Um, so in the case of human motion, um, it could be a kind of task relevant features. So for example, the distance between the hand and the object that I'm trying to reach. Uh, and there could also be other features such as I prefer to minimize effort. Um, I prefer the motion to be smooth and so on. So each one of these kind of important characteristics would be captured by a feature. Uh, and then uh, in this case, um, my the, the objective of the inverse optimal control algorithm is to recover the weights that tell us the relative importance of these features. So uh, there's a key assumption underlying most of the prior work in this area. And that assumption is that the data that is coming into the inverse optimal control um, method has been uh, segmented. And this is because we have this assumption that the cost function is constant within the time segment under consideration by the IOC algorithm. The second assumption is that most algorithms assume that the learning algorithm has access to the complete movement. So from the start to the end of the temporal segment where the cost function is constant. So uh, we thought we might be able to use IOC not just for modeling each of the individual pre-segmented action primitives, but also for segmentation. Uh, and this work was led by my postdoctoral fellow, uh, Jonathan Lin. So in this approach, we hypothesize that the cost function being optimized by the central nervous system 
is again a sum of weighted basis functions and that the weights change depending on the motion. What we then do is we run a sliding window over the observed trajectory data. And in each window, we perform inverse optimal control to extract the cost function weights. We then observe the weights changing. And we assume that if we observe a, a change in weights, this corresponds to a change in the motion being performed and therefore a segment point. So let me show you a video of what that looks like. Uh, so here we have some human movement data, and this is a person performing a squatting movement. Uh, and we have uh, simplified this data into a planar three degree of freedom model, where the three degrees of freedom are the hip, the knee, and the ankle. And what you can see in the top panel is kind of the set temporal evolution of the joint angles. And what you see in the bottom panel are the recovered basis weights by applying this windowing strategy. Uh, so uh, here uh, I'm showing these results for two different uh, participants. Uh, so on the left and the right um, are the two participants. And what you can see in the top panels are the joint angles, so the knee, hip, and ankle. And then the black uh, rectangles indicate where the motion of the squat movement occurs. And this, these black rectangles are manually, set, manually generated segments. And then what you can see in the bottom panels are the recovered cost weights. Uh, so what we can see here is that the two participants use very similar strategies for, for, for performing this movement. Um, and also what we can see is that it's very straightforward just looking at the recovered cost functions uh, to differentiate between the time when the person was moving, so when they were performing the squat action, and when they were standing still and resting between repetitions. Now, uh, that example was done with a very simple planar movement. Uh, so then what we wanted to do next was to see whether we could apply the same approach to complex full body movement. Uh, and this work was led uh, by my graduate student, uh, Kevin Westerman. So in this case, we considered uh, this uh, movement of jumping to target. So uh, you can see the video um, of the movement here demonstrated by Kevin. So you can see that this movement consists of multiple phases. We have kind of the approach, the takeoff, the flight phase, and then the landing phase. Um, so uh, we collected um, a, a large data set with 22 participants where we asked them to perform multiple sets of these jumps at various difficulties. And we vary the difficulty by changing the location of the target, either moving it uh, closer or farther away from the starting point. And we also recruited participants with different levels of expertise. So we had some participants that had never done this kind of movement before. And we also had a subset of participants that were practitioners in a practice called MoveNet, uh, where they have a lot of experience doing the, these kinds of jumping movements. Uh, and what we wanted to see is whether we could recover uh, what the control objectives uh, of the participants were during this type of movement. So here uh, I'm showing the, uh, the results uh, of all of the trajectories uh, for the middle target, uh, so the kind of medium difficulty target. And what we can see here is that while there is variability between participants, uh, we can actually recover this kind of underlying strategy uh, that everybody follows. So the uh, vertical black lines here indicate the takeoff uh, and then the landing. So what we can see in the pre-takeoff phase is the biggest um, focus is on the localizing the center of mass height and the center of mass velocity. And this makes sense because basically the jumper is trying to um, generate a projectile motion. And so that um, center of mass velocity and direction is the key uh, aspect that's going to allow the projectile of the full body to land in the target. Once we get inside uh, the flight phase, we can see that the only focus is on the position of the foot. And so basically we're swinging the foot towards the landing target. And there is no focus on the center of mass because obviously it's not possible during projectile motion off the ground. Um, and then we see this increase, uh, particularly in the height of the foot just before landing. 
Uh, and this allows the person to control foot placement timing. And then we see an increase in, again, in center of mass positioning and kinetic energy just at and after landing, which is absorbing the landing impact. So we can see that with this approach, we can recover the control objectives uh, even from this um, uh, full body uh, complex movement. And I do also want to mention that uh, this uh, data, entire data set is publicly available through our recent uh, publication. So if you're interested, uh, please check it out. Now, one issue with this approach is that we're using a fixed size window. So how should we select the window size appropriately? We know that this is going to be a critical issue because if the window size is too small, we may not have sufficient data to be able to recover the cost function. And if the window size is too big, uh, we might violate the assumption that the data inside a single window corresponds to a constant cost function. So uh, in the next phase of our work, we wanted to figure out if we could automatically uh, determine what is the minimum required window size to recover the cost function. And we also wanted to be able to detect when the cost function changes inside a window. And ideally, we would like to be able to perform this uh, analysis incrementally and eventually online to enable uh, interactive uh, human robot uh, applications. Uh, this work was led by uh, Wan Jin Jin uh, and uh, Shoshe Mu at the University of Purdue, and um, also in collaboration with Sandra Kirche at Technical University of Munich. So um, just a quick reminder, uh, we have our dynamical system uh, that is governed by the equation of motion. And what we would like to do is uh, to um, figure out what, uh, was the, uh, uh, what was the cost function that generated our optimal uh, state and input trajectory. Now, what we assume that this cost function is a weighted sum of these features phi. Now, one question is, well, what should, how do we hypothesize what these features might be? Um, so we can look to the biomechanics literature to look at some of the uh, previous uh, hypotheses that have been, um, uh, that have been formulated for uh, the optimality of human movement. Uh, but we also can imagine that there might be uh, some, uh, uh, some features that might be relevant for some movements, but not others. So if we have a larger, more comprehensive set of features, then we can also imagine that not all of those features would be active within each particular motion segment. So when we're finding the weights, we would like to simultaneously identify which features are relevant, and those features will have non-zero weights, um, of course, the irrelevant ones would be, have zero weights. And then we also want to figure out the value of those weights, so the relative importance of the relevant features. So um, we now want to find the optimal solution to this cost function subject to, a dynamic, to the dynamic constraint, to the equation of motion. So we can reformulate the cost function to include the constraint by adding the equations of motion into um, this modified cost function uh, via the uh, multiplied by uh, the Lagrange variable or the co-state variable lambda. So we know that um, if we're solving the direct optimal control problem, the way that we would do that is that by taking partial derivatives of this um, cost function and equating them to zero. So if we already have observed a trajectory that is optimal, then that trajectory should satisfy these optimality criteria. So the uh, evaluation of the partial derivatives uh, at the optimal trajectory should equal to zero. So please note here the shorthand notation that I'm using. Uh, so here, this, um, uh, this lower part indicates that I'm taking the partial derivative of L with respect to X and evaluating it at the optimal trajectory. And similarly, over here, I'm taking the partial derivative of L with respect to U and evaluating it at each of the time steps of the optimal trajectory, uh, of the control input of the optimal trajectory. OK, so if we have the full trajectory available, we can use the above equations to solve for the weights. 
So typically, the way that we do this is we reformulate, we assume that the observed trajectory might not be entirely optimal because we might have some uh, sensor noise or some uh, inaccuracy in our, uh, in our system model. And so what we do is we reformulate this as an optimization where we want to minimize the residual. So basically, we compute this partial derivatives, we compute these partial derivatives, and we want to make sure that they are, uh, we want to find the weights that result to the partial derivatives being as close to zero uh, as possible. Now, what can we do if only part of the trajectory has been observed? Uh, so in this case, we assume that the cost being optimized is still this one. So it's still over the entire trajectory. But now we are only observing, we have only observed a small subset of this entire trajectory. So for each time step, we can write the optimality criteria separately. And we can then stack and rewrite this in matrix form. Um, and so here, this uh, term fx is uh, captures the partial derivatives of this second term of the cost function with respect to the state. And phi x captures the partial derivative of the cost function, which is just the weighted, um, uh, uh, the, weighted uh, the product between the weights and the, uh, and the feature vector. Uh, and then fu captures the derivative of this um, second term of the cost function with respect to u. And phi u is the derivative, the partial derivatives of the cost uh, function j with respect to u. And here we, uh, 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 we, have, we have observed these, uh, we have only observed part of the trajectory from the time step uh, small t uh, and length l. So we don't have the entire trajectory, but only part of the trajectory. So uh, for the window that we have observed, we can combine these two equations to cancel out all but the last Lagrange multiplier. Uh, and then we can rearrange these equations to form a vector of the weights and this last Lagrange multiplier. And this uh, matrix H, which we call the recovery matrix. So uh, through this reformulation, we can see that if this matrix H is invertible, then we can uh, solve this uh, set of equations to find the weights, uh, the weights W. And this also gives us a way to figure out whether the window that we, uh, the window of observations that we have is sufficient. Because obviously we can only perform this um, inversion uh, if uh, matrix H has sufficient rank. So the recovery matrix can be used to determine when a window is of sufficient size to extract the weights by looking at the rank properties of the matrix. We can also compute the uh, recovery matrix iteratively following each time step of observations. And we can also use the recovery matrix for both motion prediction and segmentation. And I will show you that in a second. So first, we tested this approach using kind of simple simulations of a linear 1D US system. So this is, you can imagine this could be a mass spring damper system. And we uh, uh, applied some, uh, so here we, um, we have a cost function that is a quadratic cost function and has terms for the state uh, and the control input. And we assigned some weights and we found the optimal solution using a linear quadratic regulator. And these top two panels show the state and the control trajectory for this optimal solution. And then what we do is we try to recover the weights, starting with observations at each of the red arrows uh, indicated here. And what we're plotting in the bottom panel is the recovery error as we increase the number of time steps in the observation window. So the recovery error is the difference between the weights that we estimate and the true weights that we used to generate uh, the trajectory here. And what we can see is that uh, regardless of where we start in the trajectory, we can accurately uh, estimate the weights with a minimum number of steps using our method. On the other hand, using a standard KPT solver, uh, at, if we start from the beginning of the trajectory, it works quite well. But at later stages of the trajectory, uh, it performs quite poorly. And this makes sense because the KPT 
um, standard KDT solver is assuming that it's observing the entire trajectory, and that is not the case here. Okay, so now uh, we would like to apply this approach to uh, motion prediction. So the idea here is that we're observing some movement, so from a human demonstrator, from the beginning, and then we incrementally compute the recovery matrix. Uh, we add to the recovery matrix at each time step. And then we check for the rank conditions. And once we think that we have uh, sufficient observations to recover the weights at time step TC, we recover the weights and then we use them with um, an optimal planner to generate the rest of the motion. Uh, and that's shown here in green. And then we compare the motion that we predicted with what uh, we actually observed from the demonstrator. And uh, we hope that if our estimate is accurate, then we should be able to predict the motion uh, accurately. And so here is, uh, are the results. Uh, so this is using the same squatting movements uh, data set that I uh, showed you earlier. So the red line show the uh, measured data that was uh, measured from uh, the human demonstrator. Uh, and here the three joint angles correspond to, uh, again, the hip, knee, and ankle. The solid part of the red line indicates the part that we used for uh, computing the cost function, so from estimating the cost function. And then the dashed line is the part that we didn't use. Uh, and the green line indicates the prediction of our method. Uh, and so you can see that we can quite accurately predict the rest of the motion um, using uh, this approach. The second application is the question of segmentation. So we can also, so in this case, we assume that we have a trajectory that consists of multiple phases. So for example, if the person was uh, in the first phase had uh, one objective, so for example, they were reaching for a cup, and then in the second phase, they have a different objective uh, where uh, you know, they want to move their, ar their arm over to the table. Um, and what we would like to figure out is, can we uh, automatically detect when this segment point is occurring? And we can also do this by considering the rank properties of the recovery matrix. So here, R corresponds to the size of the feature vector, and N corresponds to the size of the state vector. Uh, so if the rank of the recovery matrix H is less than R plus N minus one, we have an insufficient window length. That means we cannot recover the cost function from this window. If our rank is R plus N minus one, we have achieved the minimal window length and we should now be able to recover the cost, uh, the cost weights. And if our rank goes higher than that, that means that the window includes a segment point. And so now what we can do is each time we detect the segment point, so each time H reaches rank R plus N, we can declare a segment point and then restart our approach. We basically then start uh, a new window and then start appending data to it incrementally again as before. So we tested this in simulations with a 2D robot arm. Uh, and here I'm showing two cases. So in case one, we just have two uh, features in our, uh, in our feature vector. Uh, one is the torque of joint one and the other is the torque of joint two. And then the different phases correspond to different relative weightings between these two. So we generate the trajectory. And what you can see here is that we can, the, the red vertical lines correspond to each of the uh, phase crossing points. Uh, and what we can see here is that we can accurately uh, recover the weights. In case three here, we also add a third feature, which is not always active. So you can see in phase one, the feature is uh, active, but not in phases two or three. Uh, and we can see that in this case, we can also recover the weights even when we have uh, features that are partially irrelevant. Now, if we compare this approach with using fixed windows, we can see that with the fixed window approach, we can also estimate the weights, but not as accurately. And particularly, we cannot as accurately identify the exact uh, switching point. And also, the, as we expected, the 
uh, the fixed window approach is sensitive to the size of the window, which we, this is an issue that we eliminate uh, with this approach. Now, we have also been applying this uh, IOC approach to more complex tasks. Um, and this work uh, has been led by uh, my postdoc, Pamela Carreno Medrano, and also in collaboration uh, with Jenshin Venture and her students at uh, the Tokyo University of Agriculture and Technology. So uh, in this work, we asked participants to uh, create these complex assemblies that you can see in the figure here. And we asked them to do this under varying amounts of pressure. So in one condition, we allowed them to take as long as they wanted to uh, create the assembly. And in another condition, we uh, gave them a very strict time limit so that they were under a lot of pressure, under a lot of stress. So we recorded both motion capture and video of, uh, of these experiments. And then we asked uh, uh, observers in a second perceptual studies to observe the video data and rate the motion in terms of valence and arousal. So basically, uh, the arousal in this case was measuring you know, how stressed, um, how agitated, were the participants. We then ran inverse optimal, the, the inverse optimal control algorithm that I just described earlier on the observed trajectories to see if we could see any differences in the recovered weights. And in this case, we considered both task dependent and affect related features. And what we found is that the trajectories uh, in the kind of agitated and uh, the relaxed state were different and we could see that in the recovered weights. So what we found is that uh, for low arousal sequences, uh, task-related terms were prioritized and economy of motion was prioritized. But in high arousal sequences, there were much higher weights on features related to movement activity. Um, so we are currently working on applying this idea also to motion generation to see if we could also generate robot movement that both accomplishes the task, but also communicates um, some affect, uh, affective features, so such as agitation uh, or nervousness. Uh, I'd now like to switch over to the second half of the talk. Uh, and here, I want to talk about how we can estimate human objectives for robot behavior when we cannot obtain an, a demonstration. So instead, in these uh, types of applications, we want to figure out the objectives through user feedback. So either through preference selection or through correction. So as an example, uh, consider the case of integrating a mobile robot into a warehouse. So to introduce a mobile robot uh, in this kind of space, uh, we, a human teacher needs to let the robot know about uh, his or her preferences for robot behavior. So where are the start and end points? Where are the preferred directions of travel? Where are the no-go zones and so on? And these robots typically, uh, the kind of tasks that they would be doing are material transport tasks. So here is an example of a real warehouse map that was provided by our industrial partner, Clearpath Robotics. So to deploy an autonomous material transport robot in such an environment, the robot first gets a map of the environment, and this could be either from CAD or by teleoperating the robot and using the robot's onboard uh, measurements to generate a map. And then a human operator needs to specify some in additional information on that map. So first of all, the locations of the start and goal positions, so where the material would be picked up, where it will be dropped off, and where the robot needs to go for recharging. Now, in addition to that, the operator might also specify zones of avoidance, uh, so where the robot shouldn't go, uh, zones of reduced speed, so where the robot should be moving slower uh, than usual, and also in, a, in warehouses where human operated forklifts are operating at the same time, uh, those types of warehouses will typically already have roads that are marked on the floor and uh, forklifts will be obeying those road rules. So the operator would likely prefer that the robot also respects those road rules to make the robot behavior more predictable to the other users. So both the other drivers and also any pedestrians in the space. So uh, here's a simple, very simple example. Uh, so in this simple example, we have um, a, uh, some kind of warehouse environment and the user has specified the start and end position, which is here marked by the blue S and G circles. Uh, and also some no-go zones that are marked by the red areas. Um, 
a reduced speed zone where the robot can only operate at half velocity, which is indicated in yellow. And there are some roads that are uh, in magenta with the allowed direction with, indicated with the green arrow. So now that we've been given such a specification, we can imagine uh, one solution to that problem would be that we represent this environment as a graph. We remove edges where there are no-go zones and opposing one-way roads. We increase the cost on edges that are reduced speed zones. Uh, and we decrease the cost on edges that correspond to one-way roads. Um, and we, then we just use a standard graph search method to plan the best path. However, this approach might not lead to the very desirable robot behavior. Well, why is that? Well, first of all, users may not be familiar with the robot behavior or capabilities, so they may not know how detailed the specification needs to be. So what does the robot need to be told and what can it do on its own? Users might also have varying levels of trust in the autonomy. Some users might provide much more detailed specifications because they don't trust autonomous decision making, while other users may believe that the robot is much more capable and knowledgeable than is actually the case. So this can result in very different specifications between different users, and these differences can have a huge impact on the robot's performance. Now, the other issue is that the user may not care about some restrictions as much as others, but how do we get the user to tell us about these relative, relative importance between uh, the restrictions? Users might find it really difficult to tune these numbers because this could potentially be a large set of non-intuitive parameters. And finally, users, especially novice users, may not have a clear understanding of how their specification might impact the robot performance. So a small change in the specification can significantly increase or decrease the robot's effectiveness. So in this project, uh, what we wanted to do was to develop an approach to collaborate with the user to figure out uh, what the correct specification to the robot is. Uh, so basically, we want to come up with a specification that satisfies all the task constraints and also incorporates the user preferences about robot behavior. So rather than asking the user to specify the weights on their constraints, we show the user potential paths that the robot can take to achieve the target tasks and ask them to rate these alternatives. And then we learn the specification from the user's feedback. In particular, what we want to learn is the weights on the constraints in terms of the performance benefit that's required to allow violation. So this work uh, was led by my PhD student, Nils Wilt, uh, in collaboration with uh, Professor Stephen Smith at the University of Waterloo uh, and also Clear Path Robotics. So here, we model the user preferences as a cost over the path PJ, and we model this as a weighted sum of features plus the time that it takes to traverse the path. So you can notice that this model of user uh, of the, the user preferences or the user cost function is very similar to what we had before. Basically, it's a weighted sum of features. Um, however, in this case, we ask the user to tell us what the features are. Uh, and so in this case, the user tells us what are the no-go zones, what are the roads, and so on, and these form our features. So what we would like to know is the relative importance of respecting those uh, those constraints and rules that the user has told us about. So here is the workflow of the proposed method. First, we have our warehouse environment from which we derive the base specification. So this is the map of the environment represented as a graph before any uh, user constraints have been added. We then ask the user to provide an initial specification. And this is through a specification interface we provide. Essentially, we show the user a map of the environment we ask them to mark up uh, where are the no-go zones, where are the roads, and so on. And then finally, in the third stage, we interact with the user through a learning process to generate a final specification that improves the robot's performance while respecting all of the user's preferences. Now, we want this process to be convenient for the user. And that means we want to limit the amount of time that we have to ask the user for feedback. So the key idea behind our approach is the concept of equivalence regions. Uh, what we realize is that uh, we don't actually need to identify the weight value uniquely, because there could be a range of weight values that leads to the same path. 
So we only need to identify which equivalence region the user's preferences lie in. So we want to come up with alternatives that will allow us to maximize equivalence region removal. Here is kind of a simple illustration of this idea. Uh, so in this case, we have a very simple environment that just contains eight nodes plus uh, the start and goal locations. And the user has defined two uh, avoidance zones, uh, which are marked in red. Uh, and these correspond, these avoidance uh, zones each correspond to one weight, so weight one and weight two. So if we were to obey all of the user um, uh, preferences and assuming that these um, weights are uh, the maximum value, then the blue line here shows the path that we would take. But then we want to figure out actually what is the value of these weights and are there, um, is there a performance benefit for which the user would prefer that we violate uh, one of these preferences? So initially, before uh, we've done any interaction with the user, we know that the true weights must lie somewhere inside the weight space, which in this case is two-dimensional. So our feasible space initially is the entire weight space. Now we ask that we show the user two alternatives, the green path and the blue path, and we ask them, which one do you prefer? And by obtaining the user feedback, we basically eliminate a part of the weight space. A part of the weight space becomes infeasible. So if the user told us that they preferred path two, then we know that the weight must be in the green area. And if the user told us that they preferred path one, we know that the weights must lie in the blue area. And by generating a sequence of these uh, uh, queries, we can very quickly reduce the feasible space until uh, the entire feasible space co consists of just a single equivalence region, and then we have converged to the solution. So we tested this approach in a user study where we asked users to generate specifications on an actual industrial environment. We provided each user with a description of the environment and the robot's tasks, which included moving material from the loading dock to storage, uh, from the loading dock to the manufacturing area, uh, to the charging station, and so on. There was a set, a a set of multiple start and goal locations. Uh, we recruited 31 participants. Uh, and uh, we asked each of the participants to generate a specification and then interact with the system to uh, come up to elicit the user's preferences uh, for the relative weights of each of the features in the specification. So out of our participants, some were novices and some had used the interface repeatedly. And we also limited the system to 20 rounds of interaction or less. So the system could query the user uh, at most 20 times to come up with uh, the specification. We also developed assessment metrics that would allow us to quantitatively assess the system performance. So the first metric, and the one that I'll be showing you here, is the time ratio. So the time ratio describes the ratio of the average optimal path duration between the two specifications. Uh, and here I'm showing the time ratio between the initial uh, and the final and the base specification um, uh, so basically, the, the difference between the time it takes the robot on average to perform uh, all of the possible tasks, if there were, uh, if there were no um, user specifications, and then uh, if they were using the initial specification of the user, and then uh, the one with the adjusted weights that we learned through interaction. Uh, so what we can see here is that uh, initial specifications are very variable, especially for novice users. And we can have some specifications that result in robot paths that are up to 3.5 times longer than the baseline. Um, so that means that the robot is much, much slower at accomplishing the tasks than uh, it would be without the user specification. After the learning process, so in the final column, we see that we obtain a significant decrease in the time ratio as well as a significant reduction in variability between users. And particularly, novices benefit from the learning process. And those that have the worst initial specification benefit the most. And as a result, the learning procedure eliminates the difference between novices and repeat users, improves the robot's performance, and reduces the variability due to different users. And this is really exciting because it shows the potential that with this kind of 
a fairly quick interaction process, we can significantly reduce the need for substantial training of robot users. Uh, and this really opens the path for true novice users to be able to use the robot competently and effectively. More recently, we have also been investigating whether we can expand this approach to learn not just from uh, preference uh, selection, but also from corrections. So in this approach, we have, we, uh, have some environment and what we would like to simultaneously learn is what are the features and also uh, what is the relative weights on that feature. So what we, the way that we do, uh, uh, we implement this approach is we show the user an initial path that's shown here in blue. And then um, the user shows us a corrected path, the magenta path. Uh, and then from this feedback, so here again, we have a uh, less preferred and a more preferred path. And from this feedback, we would like to uh, generate uh, an estimate of the user preferences. So um, in the work that I've uh, uh, shared with you today, um, uh, we have looked at two different ways to estimate user preferences um, by assuming that the user has an internal, uh, the user is trying to optimize an internal cost function, which is a weighted sum of features. The key issue, uh, and still an open question, is how can we specify those features? So one option is to start from an exhaustive set of features. So in this case, we kind of hypothesize many possible things that a person could think are important, uh, and we use that set. However, there's a trade-off in using this approach because the larger the feature set, the more data uh, we need to estimate this cost function and to identify which features are relevant and which are not. Another approach, which I showed you in uh, the second half of the talk, is to allow the user to specify the features. Um, now, this can also be challenging because, uh, especially with novice users, they might initially specify an incomplete or an incorrect set of features. So with this type of approach, it's very important to also allow the user to revise features. A third approach uh, which is a very active area, especially in uh, inverse reinforcement learning method, is to use a non-parametric model of the cost function to avoid having to specify features. Uh, so, of course, this approach doesn't have the drawback of having to know what the features are, but the disadvantage is that typically we need a lot more uh, training data uh, to generate the cost function. A second area uh, of uh, active work in our group is implementing the recovered um, uh, the recovered cost functions uh, on uh, physical robots, and particularly looking at robots with different morphology. Uh, and what we would like to understand uh, is how well does the learned model generalize? Uh, so if we have a different task, if we have a different task context, if we have a different morphology, uh, or if there's some other change uh, in the environment. Uh, and finally, uh, especially with uh, the online methods that I described earlier, we're very interested to see if we can uh, estimate the uh, human objectives in an online manner so that we can then use those estimates to generate um, appropriate robot responses uh, during human-robot interaction. So I would like to end this talk uh, by thanking all of my students, uh, collaborators, uh, and sponsors, uh, both my students, uh, uh, here at Monash and also my students uh, still at the University of Waterloo. Uh, my uh, collaborators, uh, my sponsors, uh, and also uh, my fund the funding agencies, thank you all very much. Uh, and finally, uh, I would like to uh, thank you all for uh, attending this virtual talk. Uh, normally at this stage, I would be very happy to uh, take any questions. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we're not able to do that, but if you do have any questions, I would very much uh, welcome uh, your feedback and your questions. Please contact me uh, on my email uh, that you can see here. Thank you very much for listening.